The next technique I teach is Twins of Fury. Uh, some of you guys probably know this as Twins of Aggression or Aggressive Twins. Uh, this is a defense against a high two-handed push. Okay, so we've worked a couple of push techniques on our previous list. We worked the high aggressive push, and we worked the low push, sort of a, an at-range push. This is a high aggressive push. This is somebody who's really trying to slam you with it. This is actually a personal anecdote. This is one of the first Kempo techniques I ever used spontaneously in a self-defense situation. I was in high school, guy gave me a hard shove, I hopped back, pushed his shove off, and hit him right in the knee, and that was it. I mean, I didn't break his knee or anything, but it, it was shocking him, it stunned him, kind of stunned me because it happened spontaneously, and I was like, whoa, that's a Kempo technique, right? And, and it was very effective. It immediately put the brakes on the situation. He was like, ah, and he was kind of like, that, that was the end of it, right? So in this technique, high two-handed push comes in. We're going to step back, and the first move is the same first move we practiced in delayed sword. Only this time we're going to practice it against the outside of the arm, okay? So we practice it on the inside of the arm as a block. Here we're going to practice it on the outside of the arm against the high push. Now, one of the things we cover when we talk about push techniques, we do some basic push drills. Um, one of them is just learning how to base. And we talked a little bit about this previously, which is this idea of I don't want to get pushed and go back over my heels. If you're rolling back over your heels, you're going to end up falling to the floor or, you know, you, you're not able to stop. We need to be able to put the brakes on right away. So one of the things we'll do is we'll just push each other back and forth. And I just want the students to be able to hit a good, hard, neutral bow, right? Put the brakes on immediately. If you get a lot of energy in there, it may be a little bit of distance or you may skip a little bit, but you want to hit the brakes as quick as you can, okay? And we're going to practice this, and another thing we're going to work on here is vocalization, which I think is a really important part of our training, especially for training for self-defense. And, and I want the students to get into it a little bit, right? Get mouthy with your partner. Hey, you this, that, and the other, and I don't like your shoes, and you took my parking spot, and get your students yelling at each other. Get them into it, right? And at first, people will be real timid, and, yeah, right? And they're kind of they're a little embarrassed, but once you get them to break that ice and they really start getting vocal with each other, they'll find it energizes their performance, it energizes their techniques, and it raises the adrenaline level. So again, as an instructor, you have to be in control of that, right? You have to make sure people, your students don't get hurt, right? I've been on all three sides of the triangle. I've been the guy who's hurt, I've been the guy who hurts his training partner, and I've been the instructor who has a student get hurt in their class. You don't want to be anywhere on that. And if you do karate long enough, you will be on all three points of that triangle. But it's, you never want injuries to happen to anybody, to you, to your training partner, to your students. They do happen. They're a part of what we do. But you try to minimize that. A good instructor should always be in control of the training that goes on on his floor. So the high push comes in. We've worked some vocalization. We've worked hitting the brakes with a good neutral bow. And we also want to work this gate principle of being able to sort of slide off the, the line of those attacks. And that's something especially that's going to play into some of the later push techniques we're going to work, where we're really going to be moving inside and outside the push. But here, the reason I bring this up is because I see some people practice these techniques as a defense before the push makes contact. I think it's really important to practice these techniques as the push hits you and changes your position, and then you're blocking their arms off the body. Now, of course, practice it the other way, too. Ideal situation, you never your opponent never gets his hands on you, right? You defend before that push makes contact. But to really understand how a push works and how it affects your position and, and how you need to be able to respond to that and hit the brakes and all the other things that go along with pushes, you have to train with that sort of contact, with that sort of energy. And so that's how I always want these students to practice these techniques. So get them into that. Get them into those push drills. Get them used to really pushing each other and getting physical. Right? This is a physical activity. We don't do no contact karate. I know there are Kempo schools out there that don't get within 18 inches when they're doing self-defense techniques. I know there are Kempo schools out there that everything is touch contact. That's not the Kempo I was raised with. That's not how my students practice. We're going to get physical with this material. So when that push comes in, you get pushed. And you need to be able to hit the brakes, occupy the mid-zone with a check, and get those arms off you with a hard inward block. Okay? Block. Now, the same thing we did here with our hands and alternating fists, we're going to do here with our feet, okay? So when the push comes in, block, side kick, side snap kick to the close knee, step through front kick the groin, land with a universal check position. Now, people say, which knee do I kick? What, you know, do I, what if my opponent steps forward? What if he steps back? The beauty of this technique is it doesn't matter how he steps, 
doesn't matter how he reacts, you kick the close knee, you kick the groin. If you step back and block, and you kick his knee, and he stumbles back from it, step through and kick him in the groin. If you step back and block, and you kick his knee, and he puts weight over it, step through and kick him in the groin. I don't care what he does, it's knee, groin. Now obviously, you don't have to break somebody's groin and rupture their testicles to be successful in self-defense, especially if it's just a push. But we're proceeding on the assumption, if we're going to break a knee and rupture someone's testicles, that again, level 11 situation, voluming, right? If it's not, it could be enough to just sort of use that, especially once we learn some of our other kicks, heel hook kicks and things, maybe we're just popping out his base. Maybe instead of a front kick to the groin, I do a teep, and I just hit him at the top of the hip girdle and cause the break in his posture, and from there I can just push him to the ground, right? Maybe it's enough to just get his hands off me, just be like, hey man, keep your hands to yourself, no pushing, right? But we understand we're teaching this in the physical uh, interaction at this level 11 situation. So the guy comes in and pushes. You have to set the brakes so that you don't go off. You know, if he's going to push and follow with strikes, we want to get our hands up to defend right away, right? So he pushes us, we hit the brakes, we clear his hands away, knee, groin, universal check position. This universal check position is so important. We're going to practice that as a fighting stance when we start doing our freestyle. We're going to practice it more towards the opponent and more to away from the opponent. Understanding how to use this arm to clear this whole zone, use this hand to clear high. Now this is more defensive than this. Here I'm more ready to strike, here I'm more ready to defend. But understanding how each position works, what the pros and cons are, and when to apply them is part of learning martial arts. right? So he comes in, he attacks, and we've actually done this before here, right, in our escaping the bear technique. So again, it's the inversion of that position. I talked about this earlier. We do that sort of thing all the time in Kepo. Left is right, up is down. What we do with the hands, we do with the feet, like in this technique, right? It's alternating fists with the legs, right? So the push comes in, just like when the push came in here, we blocked and countered here. The push comes in here. We block and counter here. Now, again, we're talking about building these sorts of progressive patterns through the training. So in a previous technique, we used two front kicks to our opponent, and we went groin body. Now we're using a side kick and a front kick, and we're just moving the targeting reticle a little bit further down. So instead of going groin body, we're going knee groin. Now the student's learning, oh, I've got these kick counters. I can kick low mid, I can kick high, I can kick different targets, I can, I can make a conscious decision about where I hit my opponent and what kind of effect I want to get out of him. Remember, again, beginner techniques, beginner material for beginner students, okay? Advanced students understand I can kick this guy a hundred different ways with a hundred different kicks from a hundred different angles and get exactly the effect I want. The beginner student is still learning What's a side snap kick? This may be the first time they've done this. In fact, it is the first time they've done this in a technique scenario, right? So the high push comes in, defend, counter, kick, universal check. And that's Twins of Fury, okay? We're going to explore some of these themes again in some of our later techniques, and we're going to see how we can apply these from a couple of different positions and how we can do them against different attacks. And what if his push is so aggressive that we don't set the brakes and we hit the ground, right? That's something we're going to explore again. So each of these lessons gets repeated in a lot of different ways because that's an important part of ingraining it into the student, okay? And this is a great technique to practice when, you're, when you have beginner students and you start to do some street freestyle with them. Have them just practice, okay, we're, we're checking range, and can you just hit that side snap kick and keep your opponent off? Can you keep him off with low line kicks, which are a shorter range weapon? Can you keep him off with mid line kicks, which are a longer range weapon? Can you use snap kicks versus thrusting kicks, right? How do you use your stance? How do you use your hips? All these things are lessons for beginners. Now, you don't want to overfeed your fish. You don't give them 10,000 notes every time they do a technique, right? When you talk about instruction, one of the basic tools that I use is praise, correct, praise. I could have a student do this, the worst repetition you've ever seen. They come up and go, right? And I go, hey man, I love your enthusiasm there. One of the things I want you to focus on is trying to hit that neutral bow, right? Now, that was great. Let's try it again and see if we can get a little bit better neutral bow out of that. I didn't hit all the things they did wrong because they're a beginner. They're going to do everything wrong, 
right? I picked one basic thing that they can get better on. I gave them some pointers on how they can improve on it, and the next time they do it, maybe the neutral bow is a little bit better, and I go, hey, that was that neutral bow I was looking for, good job. Now that we've got that nailed down, let's see if we can really nail that side snap kick. And over time, in a series of repetitions, as they continue to come to class and work this material, they're going to sharpen it up, and we're going to start working into drills, and they're going to be really effective with this material. But the first time they do it, I expect beginners to be bad at things when they learn them for the first time. And that takes the pressure off of them. I have a lot of beginners, they'll do a technique and they'll get like three repetitions in and they'll be like, oh, I can't figure this out. It's so hard. It's the most difficult technique I've ever done. Well, how many times have you done it? I've done it three times and I don't have it mastered yet. Okay, I've been doing it for 15 years and I still have a long way to go, right? So it's important to make sure the beginners understand but this is a process, and they're in it, and they need to keep working at it, and that you're going to be patient with them, and you're going to work with them and help them improve, right? So the push comes in, let it push you when you're working the technique. In defense, maybe you block ahead of time, maybe you don't block soon enough and you get pushed, maybe you get pushed to the ground and you have to adapt and do something else, which we're going to cover. But for here, you get pushed, you clear the arms off you, and that's going to put your opponent out of position right away. Again. Once I break his posture by turning his hips like this, he has to rebase and reposture before he can do something. That's my chance to enter. So it's all about knowing when to enter with these techniques. So he hits me, I fall back, I push his arms off me, kick the knee. No matter what happens, it's knee groin universal check. Okay? So that's Twins of Fury. If you guys have any questions, let me know.